Hi, I'm Sean Brown, McKinsey's Director of Alumni Relations, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our 194th Alumni Knowledge Webcast on Reimagining Capitalism, inspired by the recent book of the same name. During this session, we will discuss why the current model of capitalism, which has been, excuse me, <clears throat> which has been an unprecedented engine of wealth creation for centuries, is increasingly in need of modernization, as well as what moving the global economy toward a more responsible, equitable, and sustainable model of capitalism would look like. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few brief notes on how to operate your webcast console. For those joining by a mobile device, the interface will be slightly different, but the functionality to view the slides, presenter's video, and to submit questions is the same. Your audio feed is shared automatically through your speakers. If you'd prefer to listen via telephone, close the small audio broadcast dialog box, then go to the participants panel located at the upper right side of your screen and click the phone button at the bottom left of that panel. Please note for privacy reasons you will see only yourself in the attendee list in the particip participants panel. We encourage you to submit questions at any time during the session. Just go to the Q&A panel located at the lower right side of your screen, type your question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, and click the send button. I will review and share your questions throughout the session, and we look forward to an engaging discussion. If you experience any technical difficulties during the session, please use the Q&A panel to request assistance or dial plus one four zero eight four three five seven zero eight eight. We are recording this session and we'll post the recording in the alumni webcast library to accompany the materials we've already shared on the alumni website. Dom has also offered to provide a complimentary ebook of reimagining capitalism to all attendees who request it via our survey at the end of today's session. Finally, if you'd like to download a copy of today's slides to annotate during the session, please use the link that is currently being shared in the chat panel on the middle right side of your screen. Now I'd like to briefly introduce our presenters. Dominic Barton has been Global Managing Partner of the firm since 2009 and joins us today from New York. He's advised clients across a range of industries and authored over 80 articles and books on a wide variety of topics, including his work on reimagining capitalism. He's the co-chair of the Focusing Capital on the Long-Term Initiative, which seeks to develop practical structures, metrics, and approaches for longer-term behaviors in the investment and business worlds. He's also chair or a member of a range of other boards across Asia, Europe, and North America. Dom holds a BA from the University of British Columbia and a master's from Oxford. John Kay is one of Britain's leading economists and joins us today from London. He is a director of several public and private companies, has been a contributing author to the Financial Times for the past 20 years, and has also authored a wide range of articles and books on economics, including his recent work on reimagining capitalism. John recently chaired the Review of UK Equity Markets and Long-Term Decision-Making, and also chairs or is a member of a number of other boards across academia and the public sector. He holds master's degrees from the University of Edinburgh and Nuffield College, Oxford. Please join me in welcoming Dom and John to today's Alumni Knowledge webcast. Dom, it's my pleasure to turn the session over to you. Thank you, Sean. Can you hear me okay? Um, so th thanks for introducing us. I just say a couple of things. One, I'm delighted that uh, John is joining us uh, in this. We've had a number of discussions about you know, capitalism and how it has to be improved and so forth. But I think you heard John's uh, distinguished background, but he's also a very outspoken and clear thinker on this. And I think reminds us that why we do want to modify and reimagine capitalism, it is the best system that is out there. And I think it's a good, he'll, I think, provide us a, a good grounding of that in some of the areas that we need to look at. But again, the book, and I don't know if you can see it, this is the book we'll, we'll send. It was a a sort of a collective set uh, from 31 different people writing about, you know, where we think the state of play is and what, what are some of the things that we need to do to try and make it even better to modernize it as, as we look ahead. Um, I, I, you know, without any further ado, I'd like to get, it, get over to John so he can sort of take us through, 
he has some slides which, which I think will sort of summarize kind of his core arguments and maybe if there's any questions right after that we can get those to John and then we just have a discussion uh, together and, and with the broader group so look look forward to it and thank you so much everyone for for joining us I really appreciate it so John uh, over to you well, thanks, Don, and it's a great pleasure to be here and to have an opportunity to discuss these questions with you. Uh, let's begin. What you can see on this slide, actually, is what symbolizes what was in many ways the, what was really the defining economic development of the last 50 years. For most of the 20th century, governments intervened more and more in the market economy. But from around 1980, that started to reverse itself. And the fall of the wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union that followed uh, was the symbolic event that was central to all of that. In, soon after the wall went down, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book with the title The End of History, in which he essentially argued that a combination of lightly regulated capitalism and liberal democracy was here to stay. It was where all the world was evolving. And yet, from, 19, from 2008 and the financial crisis then, that kind of consensus around that model has gradually been unwinding. But actually, that unwinding has, been, has not really had a coherent critique. Uh, I've always treasured this slogan, which came from uh, uh, one of the Occupy demonstrations, capitalism should be replaced by something nicer. Uh, with the worry we have at the moment is that might, it might be replaced by something much nastier, the kind of authoritarian primitivism that we've seen in discussion of, of economic development now. What I want to argue in this talk and do so at more length in the book that Don has talked about, is that actually all that era was based largely on a misunderstanding of what was the real nature of capitalism and the market economy. We didn't properly recognize that uh, the capitalism and markets only work if they're actually embedded in a social context. And what is nicer than capitalism is actually a proper description of how capitalism at its best really works. That's what I want to sketch, and I want to suggest that the market fundamentalism, which we've been used to, uh, was a description of the capitalist economy which succeeded both in being unpleasant and essentially false. It was round about the propositions of based on what economists think of as rational economic man, the idea that self-regarding materialism was the dominant motivation. Uh, Gordon Gecko famously said in the film Wall Street that greed is good. And Alan Greenspan uh, basically represented this market fundamentalism at the Fed for 20 years, believing that restrictions on the operation of free markets are costly and should be minimized. I was looking back in preparation for this talk in my slide library to a talk I gave more than 10 years ago, and just looking at some of the more extreme manifestations of that kind of market fundamentalism. The trouble with the French is they don't have a word for entrepreneur, and Mark Stein of American Enterprise Institute, I'm much more worried about economic development in Holland and Denmark than Iraq or, or, or Pakistan. I actually, back in preparation for that talk, looked for a comment on it by the nastiest, most grasping businessman I could identify. And I, I actually came up with this. Uh, even Trump appeared to reject self-regarding materialism as the dominant uh, force in, in economic life. The trouble with that is that the real author of Trump's book, The Art of the Deal, Tony Schwartz, came clean in the last year and admitted that none of the book was actually written by Donald Trump at all, and this particular sentence, a couple of sentences, is his invention rather than the views of Trump himself. Trump himself probably does fit the self-regarding materialism, which, we've, built, which we're, uh, we've been describing. But I think the strengths of the market economy do not lie 
in the belief that self-regarding materialism is a dominant motivation. I don't think it is for the majority of people. Money matters to them, of course. But actually, uh, the satisfaction they get from their jobs, their friends, their family, and a whole variety of other things are not only things which are important to them, but are things that are important to the functioning of the market economy. For me, the real strengths of the market economy can be found in three areas. One I'll call prices as signals, the second I'll call disciplined pluralism, and the third is that the market economy is a means of attacking the nexus between economic power and political power. Let me say a little about each of these, uh, about each of these three. The first is that prices are signals. I think all of us know when we try to generate uh, targets or key performance indicators or whatever in our business that people actually meet the targets, which are not necessarily when they're met what we wanted them to do. There's another apocryphal story that for me epitomizes it all of the Soviet factory where the, uh, the, the workers were rewarded by the weight of nails which the factory produced. And they achieved this, not this target by producing a very small number of very large and therefore entirely useless nails. What prices as signals do is actually provide much more sophisticated guides to the allocation of resources in a market economy than do any kind of commands that you can issue from a central directorship. The second issue of uh, uh, the market economy, the second strength, is what I call disciplined pluralism. Another part of the reason why these planned economies failed is that they didn't experiment very much, and when they did experiment, they experimented on a large scale. One story that illustrates this well from the Soviet Union comes from Khrushchev's first visit to the United States. And it's suppose it said that Khrushchev was taken to visit a supermarket and when he saw the amazing range of goods on the shelves, he concluded that the shop had been specially stocked for his arrival, as of course it would have been in the Soviet Union himself. But what really most impressed Khrushchev was the fields of maize which he saw in the Midwest, because these clearly could not be faked. In his view, maize production was a key part of the U.S. economic success. So he went back to the Soviet Union, convinced that uh, what Russia needed to do was expand its maize. But, of course, there were good reasons why it was wheat rather than uh, maize that was grown in the Ukraine, the breadbasket at that time, essentially, of the Soviet empire. Uh, and yet, not only did he insist on maize production being implemented on a very large scale, he refused to hear any negative feedback of it. Indeed, the negative feedback was attributed to sabotage. One of his acolytes famously said, under socialism, maize can be grown anywhere. But of course it can't. And after successive agricultural failures, Khrushchev was finally toppled from power in 1964. That, um, single voice, the attempt to plan on too large a scale and then not to get appropriate feedback goes right through to planned societies as well as the Soviet Union itself. I found this quote from, from a British report of the 1970s uh, criticizing the electricity industry for its failure to speak with a single voice. That nationalized industry had the same phenomenon as we saw in the Soviet Union, had the, same, the, the phenomenon of, exper of undertaking very large-scale uh, new activities and then refusing to accept the feedback when the part of these didn't work. Contrast that with what is really the great success in the last few years of the market economy, which has been uh, the, the development of personal computing. Personal computing actually goes back to the 1970s, and it was Xerox, so it was an was amazingly innovative place, Xerox Park, who actually produced the first personal computer, but they didn't succeed in marketing it. It was IBM who really put a computer on everyone's desk, but IBM discovered that it actually cannibalized their own business, and IBM are not in the personal computer uh, industry anymore. DEC were actually the main produce, digital equipment, were actually the main producer of small 
uh, machines at the time, they disappeared in due course. Apple insisted on its closed proprietary system and failed. Apple only succeeded when they introduced mobile devices in the last um, in the 21st century, and if we go to 2007, we find Steve Ballmer picking up an iPhone and laughing and saying, I don't think many people are going to pay $500 for a phone. He wasn't to know that a billion people would pay $500 for that kind of phone. The point I want to make is that no one knew how this industry was evolving, and the way in which, it, in fact, it did evolve was people constantly experimented. Most of these experiments didn't work, but the ones that did were imitated, and the ones which uh, didn't succeed were abandoned. And that, for me, is the central story of why market economies and capitalism deliver in ways that planned economies never have and are never likely to. But a third part of the, of the story of uh, uh, the strength of a market economy, I'd like to just stress in conclusion, because to be pro-market is, in my view, not necessarily the same as being pro-business. And we've tended to confuse these, these two ideas. If the fall of the Berlin Wall was one of the defining moments in the history of capitalism, I think an even more central of a moment that's happened a, a century before, when the gilded age of American capitalism was brought to an end by people who were frightened of the political power exercised by people like John Rock, D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, the Fricks, and the Dukes, and the like. And that was addressed through political moves and through antitrust policies. It's uh, breaking the nexus between politics and business that enables disciplined pluralism to operate, and people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and everyone who brought mobile computing to us, but is actually central to making a market economy work. And we should never forget this idea that markets are about pluralism and that markets operate only by being embedded in the society and part of the societies in which they operate. Let me stop there and open things to discussion. Well, uh, Sean, I don't know if the, I can't see the questions coming up, but I might, while we get that, just had a, a couple. Th First of all, thanks, John, for that great uh, overview. And I think it, as I said at the outset, it kind of reminds us about why this system and its fundamentals is such a good system, uh, but really what it's about. And, and I guess I had a couple of questions, John. One is, you know, there, if you look at trust in capitalism measured by various different people, trust in business leaders, it's been dropping uh, over the last, you know, 20 years and over the last, I'd argue, since the, the financial crisis even faster. So just a sense of why, why do you think that is or what, is it this we don't have as much pluralism or is it not, you know, there's the inequality? Just sort of get a sense of what do you think is driving that um, sort of decline in trust in this system? I think there are two parts to it. One is uh, uh, the, the behavior of a lot of people in uh, business has necessarily eroded that trust. The, what has happened in the financial sector is probably the worst example of that. Uh, but I find, for example, uh, people who feel that their, uh, their phone tariffs, their energy tariffs, and so on, are misleadingly complex. They don't quite, they don't have confidence that they will go on getting a fair deal if they're loyal to their existing suppliers. And one can reproduce that right across the ways in which some businesses deal with the public. The second is I think that the enemy of pluralism has been what I described at the end as this economic political power nexus. The sense most of all in the United States but elsewhere that the influence of business on, on economic policy and by that established business, not new business. It's not a, it's not the fledgling financial fintech companies that actually have powerful friends in Congress. It's actually the large, well-established banks which have not been serving the public well. So that these two factors, I think, are, are responsible very largely 
for the decline in trust and conviction of the, the merits of a capitalist system. And, and John, just on the, you know, in, in the discipline pluralism that you, you talked about, and you talked about, you know, at the turn of the, I guess it's the last century, you know, the last lesson, 1900s, you know, the, with Standard Oil and so forth. Is there a, a sense we need, there's monopoly power, or what, what would you recommend from a system point of view if you could pull, if you could pull in three levers to, to make, make the system better? Just what, what would those, uh, what would those be now? Uh, I, think, I, think, I think one lever we need there is uh, to reduce the, the influence of money in politics, corporate money in politics, basically. Uh, we need to move away from a world in which one has a strong sense that much of legislation and regulation is designed to protect the interests of established firms. And I think we see that in a very serious way in financial services. I think we see it in an equally serious way in industries like media, where the, the, the technological opportunities have been completely transformed, and yet the interests of established producers of their newspapers or book publishers or whatever are preventing us having slowing down, because they'll never prevent it, but they're slowing down the kind of change or change which we need. The other change, right, if I can point to a couple of other levers, one is I think the key to discipline pluralism is the constant entry of new firms, and we need the parts of the of the world where it's done well. It's done well in Silicon Valley. It's done well in parts of Israel. It's done well in parts of, of Germany. The business of providing support for early stage firms in ways that enables them to engage in the kind of experimentation that we've been talking about. And I think the other lever I would pull would be to take the emphasis away from talking all the time about shareholder volume and reckoning that great and successful companies are social institutions with need not just to make money for their shareholders, although they plainly do, but also have to provide a satisfying working environment for their employees, do it by selling goods and services that people want to buy, and being respected citizens in the communities in which they operate. Excellent. So more of, again, the sort of the purpose of business is that it, it's, it's not just about not about making money or greed, as you talked about before. There's a there is a social role, and oh, by the way, if you do that well, you will do well. Is that what you're? Yeah, right. exactly right. Uh, the you know the purpose of business is really to build great businesses that produce goods and services that people want. And if you ask what motivated the people who built the great businesses of our time, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and so on, it was really passion for their industry and their product, not the desire to make a lot of money. By the way, as you say, they did make a lot of money, uh, but that wasn't what drove them. Maybe one last question, then, Sean, over to you, if you guys don't mind. I, well, just on... You know, we're seeing, and you mentioned this, you know, the innovators in the Silicon Valley or California, in um, Israel and so forth. You know, with this, a lot of the technology companies are creating a lot of value um, and benefits, but with less jobs and this sort of the whole, um, you know, automation and what's happening on that front is sort of, sort of just part of our time. Anything companies need to think about differently or, or society does in terms of dealing with that, the sort of the disruption from uh, technology. And again, I'm not a Luddite. I don't want to give you a sense I'm a Luddite, but it, there's just more than the notion of the, um, that churn. Any advice? Well, I thought you mentioned Luddites because actually this kind of worry has been around since the time of the Luddites. There's, oh. there's, there's actually a picture which I treasure of uh, my namesake, John Kay, in the 18th century, who, invented, who made some inventions in, uh, in textiles, being chased out of his, his mill uh, by a group of Luddites. Uh, these Luddite predictions that say that all our jobs are going to be taken by machines have been around for 200 years, and they've always been false, because we've always found new areas in which people gain employment. Uh, and that doesn't mean it will always be true in future, but I think we can expect that a properly innovative market economy can actually generate jobs 
and that these new technologies will generate jobs as well as, well as removing them in the way they always have in the past. Excellent. Thanks, Sean. Sean, over to you. I think you've got questions from people. Oh, yeah. We've got a bunch of questions from folks, and I want to just remind everybody that you can select all panelists when you enter uh, questions in the drop-down menu. Um, our first one is related to how do we combat uh, the tendency for businesses to maximize short-term value extraction. Uh, this alum says, e.g., if left to their one's own devices, most companies and investors prefer to clear-cut forests than embark on long-term managed forestry, as an example. Well, as you mentioned earlier, Sean, I wrote a 130-page report for the British government on that, and Don has done quite a lot of work on that issue as well. I think, for me, the largest thing is changing the culture of the relations between, um, uh, between investors and asset managers, uh, and through that, the companies we're talking about. Once asset managers come to recognize that the way the asset management community generates long-run benefit from investors is by improving the long-term performance of companies, and that they can't generate uh, wealth for the community as a whole or even for their particular investors in most cases by trying to outperform each other, which is the main thrust of what they currently do in capital market terms. I wish uh, asset managers would do, do more to enhance beta rather than chasing alpha. Uh, uh, next question is related to, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the question is, can you please comment on which group has been an effective promoter of this focus on the long term? Specifically, the, this alum says they feel that large businesses and shareholders tend to defend business protectionism. Unions and others may defend labor protectionism. But this alum is asking, you know, who defends market, uh, you know, the market and capitalism effectively? Well, I think that's the political problem, which, we, which I was talking about at the end of uh, what I had to say, that the business lobbies are very powerful in Congress, consumer lobbies very much less so. Uh, and that's why I think we need the kind of education which we're trying to do in Don's book and reimagining capitalism so that people understand what the merits of the capitalist system is. And actually, if we describe it as saying it's encouraging people to be very greedy and do pretty much what they like, then it's not surprising that we don't find much groundswell of public support for organizing a market economy and that we get the reaction that I don't want these people anywhere near my schools and my hospitals. That means we can't get the kind of benefits of disciplined pluralism in large areas of what are currently public sector activity. Have you seen any uh, examples where activist investors or fund managers that have focused on the long term had an impact? Um, I, think that, I think there are loads of examples, and we, we tend often in these kind of discussions to, to talk primarily about our own countries, in my case, Britain, and of course, the United States, everyone's focus on, on these kind of issues. Now, if, we're, if we look to continental Europe, we get very different models in which you typically have more concentrated shareholdings and uh, investors that have quite long time horizons for what they're doing. Now, in the era I was describing, the era of market fundamentalism, we tended to regard all that as rather old-fashioned and out of date, and they had to get on with things and have the kind of active capital markets we have in Britain and the United States. I think we need to rethink that issue and understand how, you know, people have uh, succeeded in generating value for the long run with different kinds of shareholding structures. I would like to see more concentrated, focused share ownership in Britain and the United States, and I think that could do a lot to promote more long-term perspectives on the part of companies and their boards. John and Sean, can I just jump in too? Just I, I fully agree with what John is saying, and I think there are 
there are some of these long-term investors, the pension funds, like uh, Canada Pension Fund or Ontario Teachers, uh, even, you know, Welcome Trust, John, I think would be, you know, they, these are institutions where their quarter, if you will, is, is not three months but 25 years, and they, they are actively encouraging and supporting the leadership teams to think that way and evaluate performance that way. You know, they, they care about social factors, they care about governance, and they care about environmental factors because it affects the business. It actually affects the bottom line over a long term. And so I think that, that what we need is a bit back to John's earlier comment. We seem to have a breakdown between the long term investors and the asset managers is, is one. So a lot of asset managers managing the long term money are being incentivized on a one year basis. Um, and so I think there, we need to see a, a, a shift, particularly too, from the long-term investors to act long-term and encourage asset managers and the companies they invest in to behave that way. I think there's a major point there, Don, and actually the way in which Canadian and Australian pension funds have been developing, you know, with uh, large funds which have very considerable in-house capabilities for asset management, a concern with a diverse range of investments that includes infrastructure and private equity and property as well as simple equity markets, uh, and with time horizons that match the long time horizons of their beneficiaries. I think these are very interesting models, and I hope will be a large part of the way in which capitalism develops in, in this century. So our next question is uh, related to the, how others and efforts to value social and natural capital, and do those efforts help put capitalism in the context that you've been describing, or are they simply distractions? I'm inclined to regard these things as distractions. You know, first of all, in a sense, it's a measure of the strengths of capitalism that people want to describe everything. Uh, using the word capital. So we have human capital, social capital, natural capital, and so on. I think these, 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 these are things in their own right, and we, we were maybe better when, when we called human capital education and social capital trust and natural capital the environment instead of trying to bring them in terms of, right, of this particular uh, of this particular metric. But I have a slight worry here that we tend to talk in reimagining capitalism in public debate about adding social and environmental goals to a profit motive, a triple bottom line as some people call it. For me the real point is that proper capitalism is about building great businesses and it's not about making a lot of money and doing a bit of good on the side. Uh, the, the, the social responsibility of business, in my view, is to be a great business in terms of delivering the goods and services people want, providing good returns to investors, and providing a, a satisfying environment for the people who work there. And that, that for me, is the, is the social purpose of business, for purposes. John, uh, Dom, would you care to comment? No, I would agree. I mean, I, I think that the you know, at the end of the day, a business is there to develop, you know, products and services that satisfy consumers in what they do. But it, I think to be sustainable over time means you do need to be thinking about your, uh, you know, your workers. You need to be thinking about the community in which you operate, the trust that you you have. That's why, for example, I think it's, it is in Coca-Cola shareholders' interest that they care about water usage. You know, the you've talked about this before, it used to like, take two liters of water to make a liter of Coke. Um, and if you're operating in environments where water, so you, you better do that. It, it's good business, if you will, as well as helping the community. You're doing it. So, so this is a an area where, where I think you have to think, if you just think about profit um, and you don't think about that your, your sustainability in that broader ecosystem, you won't be able to sustain those profits. I don't know, John, if you disagree or it's a, I'm interpreting it uh, wrongly. No, uh, I, I agree entirely, Dom. And I, I have a strong memory of once giving a talk on 
the decline of ICI, which for, for most of the 20th century was Britain's leading industrial company but no longer exists. And after that talk, I got a rather pained letter from someone involved in corporate social responsibility in ICI that said roughly, we might have messed up the business, but we did a great job on corporate social responsibility. And I thought, well, look, you really have not caught what it means. Uh, corporate social responsibility is about running a successful business in every sense. So uh, we're going to switch gears and, and talk a little bit about um, multinational. So we've seen a number of questions come in uh, asking whether you think multinational, whether companies that are local or multinational, whether it makes a difference in their ability to properly take a, a more long-term society-wide focus. Do multinationals, for example, have an opportunity to play a leadership role given that their operations cross cultures, regions, and nations? I think that's a very interesting question, but it, it must be said that the number of companies that are genuinely multinational is actually extremely small. You know, most companies are very recognizably American or British or Swiss, even if they actually operate in 100 countries around the world. There are a few companies that have really transcended national boundaries in, in that kind of sense. Uh, but it, it's it's a difficult job, and some of the issues that have been in the, in the news recently to do with bribery and corruption or tax avoidance are examples of the difficulties that one encounters in having, as it were, a single culture uh, for a business that operates necessarily in a hundred different cultures. Yeah, I mean, just to add to, to Don's comment, I, I think what I think multinationals can play a you know a very effective role in bringing, if you will, you know best practices, competitive practices from around the world, the scale and and so forth. But I think they're now in the world of where you know, or we are in the in the world of where you need to be local as well. You cannot, I, I think, you know, I think it was Jeff Email to give a a very I think telling speech last May at the Stern School of Business saying we are a multi-local organization. Do not call us a multi-national uh, because we've got to be able to uh, have the, the, the trust create the jobs and so forth in the communities. And obviously he's a very shareholder value focused guy. It's not, he's not doing this for, he just, it's a reality of how they work. So I think the conditions have, have, have changed a bit in terms of how consumers may the expect what they're expecting, or the or the environment in which they're operating, what they're expecting, and multinationals are having to to deal with that. To, to, it's a reality. And yet, he has a difficult job, balance to strike, in the sense that the scanner or the aircraft engine from GE uh, that you find in Singapore and Brazil are just the same as the ones you find find in the United States. So he has to be both multinational and local in that sense. Our next uh, question is related to technology and a critique of Silicon Valley is, 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 that's often made is that our generation's greatest minds are focused on optimizing ad clicks. <laughs> that's what makes money. Um, is that allocation of resources a good or a bad thing? You know, as, as capitalism is about optimizing the use of capital, but for many of these new businesses where social network take up and winner take all, uh, it tends to sort of shift people in terms of where people are investing their time and their, and their, uh, and their, their thinking. Well, actually, Sean, one of the reasons I prefer to talk about the market economy than about capitalism is that an awful lot of what we're talking about doesn't use much in the way of capitalism. Indeed, I thought of writing an essay under the title Capitalism Without Capital. Because if you look at, a com if you look at great, the, the largest companies we have today, you know, my, uh, Google and uh, Apple, the market capitalizations are between 500 and 600 billion dollars. Their actual tangible operating assets amount to less than 5% of that. The real value of these businesses lies in their brands, their people, and the profits they expect to generate from them over, over the next few years. 
Um, no, I don't think, um, especially when it comes to writing fake news, that maximizing the number of ad clicks is the highest uh, uh, part of human innovation or human creativity. But actually, uh, in the long run, you can only get people clicking on your ads by creating content which uh, has some enduring value. So usually the market works in that sense in the long run. Yeah, and I, I also would agree with John, too. I mean, when you were talking, I was also thinking about Airbnb, John, just, uh, you know, what assets do they really own, if you will. It's a, it's a very efficient and amazingly trust-based network. I'm probably not describing it very well, but that's its value, and it's got, a, I think, a market cap bigger than the, the largest hotel chain that owns the assets. So that's a – but for me, the I think the thing that's – maybe, again, about this uh, – the, the, it's the chart we have up on the page that John shows there, which is, you know, these, these things evolve. And I think if we start to try and control whether it's good or bad, it's, we're in danger of doing the Khrushchev thing. And I, I think one of the things about face, I think Facebook is very, very different today than it was when it started in terms of its purpose, like its impact on the world. And I think it's, you know, the Alibaba is another example. I mean, to, to think that it would go into financial services, that was never part of the plan. It was, it was discovered as they were creating and building all this data that they could actually be very good at, you know, providing loans to people. It was never part of the plan. So I, 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 may, be, I, I may be too much of the, maybe it's the anti-Luddite, but is, the, is that these things will evolve, evolve in places we can't imagine. I, I just imagine what, for example, it's going to mean for health care. What, what will... What will the, these social networks mean for how we deliver, um, provide health care in a fundamentally different way? So um, it, it may seem strange that it's all around the ad, getting ad clicks or whatever, but I, I wonder if the, the, there'll be broader benefits that we're, we're going to see and we are seeing. I think there's an absolutely key point there, Don, which is uh, that none of us know how the future is going to evolve. And even the brightest and smartest business people, the, the jobs and the gates we were talking about earlier, they didn't know how the future was going to evolve. If you talked about a smartphone in, in the year 2000, no one would have understood what you were talking about. Uh, and Apple succeeded not because they had a better idea of how the market would evolve than other people, but actually because they experimented and found what works and what didn't. And all successful businesses, and most of all the system as a whole, is one of that constant experiment, and most experiments don't work. That's why it's so difficult for large bureaucracies to innovate, because people can always find good reasons why change is, is not going to work. And that's, why, that, that's how the United States developed personal computers, and the Soviet Union didn't. Thank you both. Uh, we, I, and I also want to thank all our alums. We've got a tremendous number of questions that are coming in. Uh, our next one is around the pay gap. Uh, one of the largest slash latest complaints uh, around capitalism right now is this growing inequity in terms of pay, uh, the 99% versus the 1%, uh, large C-suite compensation versus the hourly worker. Um, this alum argues, left unchecked, this could result in um, a, a rather uh, extreme upheaval of the model uh, in terms of things like socialism, dictatorships, and uh, asking for your, both your thoughts on that. I and mean, it's a really complicated issue because if one looks at what, at what has happened to income inequality, um, it's, it, it's a tricky picture. Uh, around the world as a whole, the last 20 years have in many ways been the best ever. But more people have been lifted out of poverty in these two decades by far than in any decades in human history. And the result of the cause of that is essentially the developments we were talking about right, uh, right at the beginning, the bringing of the market economy and capitalism to most of all to India and China that has uh, uh, had dramatic impacts on global income inequality in terms of reducing it. Now, there's a paradox in that while that global inequality has, uh, has declined, 
uh, within China and India, inequality has increased. And in Britain and the United States, inequality, income inequality has increased. But I think for rather different reasons, which have much to do with the rise of financial services in these two countries. If I look at continental Europe, on the other hand, I don't find any marked trends uh, in the degree of income inequality. It's uh, in the developing world, it's just an inescapable product of an evolution towards a market economy, the kind we're seeing in China. In Britain and the United States, I think it's the result of a, of a distortion uh, in the market economy, which has come from the excessive role that financial services have played in our expansion and development in, in, in the two countries that are linked on this, uh, on this webcast. You know what? Just to add to what uh, John was saying too. I mean, I think that I'm I'm not so much concerned about the the pay gap. I know there's issues, and I, I agree with John that I think the financialization, if I could call it, out of the of the of the economy has exacerbated that. But I think in capitalism does not equal equality, right? You, you're gonna that's part of the system. It, it, there is inequality. I think the challenge is when there's inequality of opportunity when people don't have the chance to be able to participate. Um, and, and so I, I think that's the biggest driver of angst. I, I know, I'm, I do think, I'm sure that CEO pay, and that links to greed, which gets to John's earlier point, which doesn't make it a very popular topic that, cap, you know, that there, there's there. I, I don't doubt that, but I, I think at the core is this inequality of opportunity, and there's a deeper issue, which I think is really around education as well, that about how are, it's a different, you know, are we, what are, how are education systems working to ensure we get good, good jobs or allow people to reskill? And I think that's going to be a bigger issue than the pay one. The only thing I would talk about, this is, again, I know it's not an extreme, but I look at you know, one thing that China has done right now with their SOEs is they've capped the CEO comp for SOE CEOs, right? And, and I can't remember what the ratio is. I think it's like six to one or five to one, right? So these have been dramatic drops. And one of the things that has, has occurred as a result of that, there's not actually a lot of energy amongst those CEOs to drive a lot of change that's needed in those companies. I'm not saying that the pay is the driver. There's other issues going on as it relates to anti-corruption and so forth. But there's not a lot of motivation when you're being paid $250,000 a year to say, I'm going to restructure this major company. It's not going to matter too much. I, so I, I think we, again, I know there's extremes and we have to be careful about it, but let's also think about the other side of it. And the one last thing I'd just say is something that Roger Morrison told me it was at our 50th anniversary of our London office, and he said, Dom, I want you to remember when taxes were, at, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, something in the, near the close to the order of marginal taxes at 90% in the UK in the early 70s. That put, when, you, when John was talking about that energy utility, and he said to go to a company like British Steel and say, we have uh, a very good set of ideas of how you can fundamentally improve the performance of this organization. There just wasn't much appetite, no matter what the ideas were. And you sort of remind, you never forget what that does. And I don't think Roger Morrison's an anti-tax. Is it tax? But it's just more again, you know, incentives do help in the system. Yeah, I, I, we've got away from good for good from taxes in the 80% range, which were indeed what we did have in Britain then. But equally, I think we should worry about the extent to which the whole legitimacy of capitalism and the market economy can be undermined when people are making very large amounts of money which don't appear to, to people to be deserved. I think a lot of people are fairly comfortable with the idea that Bill Gates is, is very rich because they can see what he did and he seems to be a decent guy who's making imaginative use of the money which he, um, which he has raised. It's a lot harder for people to see what hedge fund managers are doing that it justifies them in taking billions out of the system. It's quite, quite, a lot hard, quite hard for me to see what they're doing that justifies taking billions out of the system. Uh, it, 
Dom, you made a point earlier about education, and one of our alums is asking or is stating, in, in most countries, uh, several large sectors of the economy, such as childhood education and health care, have typically been under rather tight control by the governments in those nations. What criteria might we use to know when a sector is better managed by capitalism versus having the government do so? I might, rest, I'm to I might let John go first as the economist and then try, try and come in. But I, all I'd say is I think there's a lot of opportunity for the private sector uh, to do more in both those sectors. Right. Um, I've just been reading a book uh, just this morning, actually, by uh, John Money on how uh, private, uh, on how the private sector interventions in education have so far not been very successful, or for that matter, been been very profitable. I think I mentioned earlier part of the problem is if we say that what capitalism is about is encouraging people to be very greedy and not regulating much what they do, then I completely understand why people are going to resist bringing these things into our hospitals and our schools. What I think I come back to the, this emphasis on discipline pluralism, which in my view is absolutely what we, we need more of in both health and education, which is the ability to experiment and then the ability to have uh, successful experimentation followed up and unsuccessful, um, uh, unsuccessful experiment closed down. And if we talked in these kind of terms about the merits of competition rather than we've talked about markets in ways that may make people rather averse to the whole idea of introducing markets into, into these areas. But if we talk about experiments and pluralism, which are what make markets effective, then I think we can make progress and bring these kind of disciplines into sectors which at present are, from a, uh, from a business perspective, really not very well run at all. But we have to try and do that while maintaining the motivation of health professionals and teachers. The people go into these things because they care about health, because they care about children. And we have to not only respect that, but nurture it, because it's what makes them good doctors and good teachers. I, I agree with what you're saying, John. And I, I also think there's the element of, of, you know, I happen to believe in, uh, and you may throw me off the call when I say this right now, but the, the notion of, of socialized med I, I do think providing basic health care for people is a good thing to do, but I think there's a way to do that that's separate from the resource allocation position. I mean, maybe I'm being too simplistic about it, but I think that in healthcare, we, I, I regret that, that we don't, aren't able to use the price signal for resource allocation. I'll give you a very recent example. And I think, by the way, consumers are going to become much more of a force and demanding in actually both of these sectors. That, you know, what Uber has done, not just for the transportation industry, but for service, I think is going to really have a, a significant I impact on things like health care. So I'll give an example, and this is a very basic level. You, I, I recently broke my kneecap on, a, on this, this run, and I need to get an MRI. And it turns out in Toronto, there's a lot of MRI machines that aren't, you know, those machines are not used uh, typically more than 12 hours a day. It's not very good asset utilization. And why can't I, why couldn't I look at a, an app, an MRI app, and say, well, there's one at, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning in this part of the city. You're going to have to pay this much to be able to get it done. Um, you do it. You know what I mean? I don't, and I think there's a, that's a, a, probably a very stupid, silly, personal example. But I, I think that there's a, a lot that the, the price signal can do to provide uh, better services, more efficient, effective services um, if you allowed more of the market to operate in that. And, and yet, again, I, it doesn't mean that you, you, you can't have a system that also supports, at a basic level, uh, health care education for people. Dom, one of the... Uh, apart. Do, I, do I attack that or, go, or, or say... Or I, miss. I must say I found health uh, 
a very difficult issue in this sense. I come from a country where an American people watching this from the US may find this hard to believe, but it would be political suicide in the UK for anyone to suggest interfering with a system of single-payer socialized medicine. It's just not even a possible area of political controversy. And yet, when I come across our National Health Service, I kind of weep at the inefficiency of this activity viewed from a business point of view. It's a, it's a difficult thing to get right. So given the importance of um, leveraging things like pricing mechanisms, one of our alums ask, is asking, what would you think is an alternative of a, a guaranteed universal basic income that people could use for things such as health care, education, and other needs? Okay, the arithmetic of a basic income is very simple, and it says either you set it at a level so low that nobody could live on it, or you set it at a level which people can live on, at which rate, at which level the tax rate needed to fund it becomes so high that you can't afford it. Uh, it sounds an attractive proposal. It breaks down as soon as you actually get down to the detail and the numbers. And the truth is, our welfare systems are complicated in the way they are, not because of institutional perversity, but because they have to be complicated if they're to achieve the task of getting benefits to people who need them at reasonable cost. Tom, would you like to comment? Well, my only comment is I, I would agree with John's analysis you know, of, the, of how, how do you square the, square the circle, so to speak. I, the only thing I would say is I think that there's a lot that can be done with social programs uh, by using our data more effectively. And this is where I think some regulations get into effect. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, no, there's some principles in that guaranteed income which I actually like. I, I'm not suggesting we move to that, but the notion that people, there's a lump sum, if you will, that people can use, and there's a, a analysis done on the need that's much better. And you'd be amazed with the silos that we have about the different you know, amounts that we're giving to people in different areas. Um, just, I know in, in Canada, you know, it's actually I think IBM that's done this and taking data, social innovation, taking data from the police, from healthcare, um, uh, from education, understanding where the biggest users of the social services are, and then, on, and then trying to figure out what are the ways, the root causes by which you can uh, make it better. I think there's ways of, of more effectively spending that subsidy which would help more people. It doesn't, I'm not answering your guaranteed income. I, I just think there's a lot of things that could be market principles, an analysis that could be done to refine or make more precise subsidies and things like that that, that, uh, that, that we use. And, and one of the principles I like about guaranteed, I'm not saying to go there, is this notion of a lump sum, people can make a choice as to how they want to do it, as opposed to maximizing in certain silos. Thank you. Um, our next question is related to emerging market economies. So our alum asks, what are some of the key opportunities in emerging market economies for them to adopt and grow their economies without having to go through some of the uh, capitalist paths that may have taken other countries uh, in bad directions. Uh, in other words, what would your advice be for a developing economy to enhance and encourage uh, long-term capitalism? Oh. <laughs> I, I, and the most important thing in all of this is actually to get across the idea that the way in which you become rich is you create new wealth rather than appropriate wealth that other people have created. And if one was to put in one sentence the difference, the explanation of why some countries in the world are rich and others remain poor, it would be that the ones that are rich are the ones that have succeeded in directing entrepreneurial effort into making new wealth rather than getting, getting old wealth. 
and you're getting other people's wealth. And that's a tricky balance to maintain because even in countries like Britain and the United States, we have the problems we've been describing earlier of people engaging in political lobbying in order to get, um, in order to get more favorable treatment for themselves. It's a battle you have to fight all the time, uh, but removing that kind of widespread institutionalized semi-corruption is really the key to promoting successful economic growth. I, I really like what John is saying on that, and I would, uh, you know, just maybe add, or it's a piece of what he's saying, is it, it's good governance, if, if you will. I think governance, you know, not only in terms of how the political system works, but how uh, companies work, uh, you know, how decisions get made. I remember Bob Felton, who, who is one of our uh, alumni now, and when he was leading our Korean office, always did a he did, a, he did governance scores, right, and for, the, for the country and how investors perceived it. And it was a, it, it had a very direct linkage to, you know, how people looked at the value of companies and, and where they were and, and how it moved. And I think getting the governance right is so critical to building the trust, to allowing people to invest, to people believing it's going to be fair. I, I think that... Um, if, if you don't have that, it's not, it, it won't work. Our next question um, is related to uh, how would you respond to Michael Sandel's concern that we are moving from, a, from being a society that has markets to becoming a market society? I think Sandel's observation is essentially there are some things uh, that we just feel are off limits for markets. You know, things like markets in body organs and uh, and areas like that. And it's it's back to, as it were, the social embeddedness of a functioning market economy. That it has to be in tune with the values of the society in which it operates. And if it commodifies some transactions that we just feel don't think should be commodified, then we start under, uh, undermining the legitimacy of a market economy. I, I couldn't say it any better than what you said, John. I think that it, it's more it's the latter to the to the question. I think you asked Sean that it's uh, it shouldn't be what defines us. And I think there is a school of thought right in Chicago, right, John, that's had this sort of view that everything at the end of the day is the market or economics. I may be exaggerating. I don't want to say Chicago. You know what I mean? It, it, it's a certain Chicago school that had that view. And I, I remember from my economics professor talking about this. I think he wrote a paper called Eskimo Economics, right, which is the notion that, you know, when you're beyond your productive age as an older person, you take the long uh, march out into the snowstorm and don't hopefully come back because that's the productive thing to do. And that may be, in fact, the productive thing to do, but it may not fit the kind of the values that, that you have. So I do think that there's the, the values, you know, overseas, if you will, where the market is going to be. Yeah, it goes with another Chicago article which explains that people commit suicide when the net present value of their future utility becomes negative. There may be a bit of a perception issue with that one too now. Um, our, uh, our next question is uh, people may not be driven by pure money maximizing economics but what about corporations and financial institutions where their goal really is to maximize returns for their shareholders? That's how they're rewarded. What are some of the ways to sort of to, to fix that? Uh, coming back to this notion of uh, your discipline pluralism, John, how do you ensure that that's the way companies behave? Well, go back to the, the, the Lehman example and the problem with Leroy, even more Bear Stearns, which famously has on its trading floor, we make nothing but money. And the lesson of Bear Stearns was that if you make nothing but money, in the long run, you don't make very much of that either. And if you ask what went wrong with these organizations, it wasn't actually 
but they were excessively focused on making money for their shareholders. Individuals were excessively focused on making money for themselves, and that ultimately destroyed these, these organizations. It's why this purely instrumental view of corporations cannot actually survive in the long run. Tom, any comment you'd like to share? No, I have nothing to add. I think that I fully agree. You have to have a purpose. If it is just about, I just don't think you'll be sustainable. I don't think you'll attract talent over the, uh, you know, over any sort of medium term uh, to be able to do it. You you won't have the, the trust. I think you're. I, I just I just don't think it's going to work. And if you look at the data, these large financial institutions have not made much money for their shareholders over the last two decades. They have made a lot of money for the people who work in them. Our next question uh, is related to impact investing. One of our alums would like to know what your thoughts are and your views are on impact investing and are the phenomena of social entrepreneurship and impact investing just hype, or are they real, and are they ways to sort of get that focus on, on sort of reimagining capitalism? And some of it's hype, and some of it is actually a genuine mechanism for getting the kind of discipline pluralism which I've been talking about into areas where, where people haven't used it up to now. It's creating structures and giving people incentives to experiment and try out different ways of doing things. And that's, that, that's great. It is, in that sense, a useful way of reimagining capitalism. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite excited by some of the, the you know, recent advances in social impact bonds. And to me, it's a way, maybe to use John's words, of putting disciplined pluralism into some social issues, right? And I, I think about things like you know, prisoner recidivism, I always mispronounce that, right? But, you know, people that go in and say, we're going to try and help, you know, these people who are coming out of prison get jobs and move it forward. And if you're, if you get a certain level of results that's better than the standard, you may get your money back. If not, it's a nice donation that you've made. I'm, I'm, I'm not describing it very properly. But, but I think that there are, we can use, um, innovation and capital markets in a broader set of areas, irrespective of what I said before about Eskimo economics. And I know there are probably some areas where lines where we can't, but I think there's a lot of areas where we can leverage the markets and, and leverage capital and investors to solve important social issues. So I, I, I'm actually quite excited by, by some of the examples that are that are that are underway and the difficulty with these kind of areas is the difficulty of finding appropriate metrics and targets it's the problem you know I was describing uh, I was describing earlier really if um, and the incentive structures tend to, to focus on the uh, on the metrics that's why we need people who are uh, concerned with the totality of what it is you're trying to achieve in these areas. And so we are coming up on time. I'm going to try and squeeze in a couple more questions. I do want to thank our alums for all the questions that they've asked. And we will provide an opportunity for you to follow up with, with Dom and John subsequent to the session. Our next, uh, we want to move into implementation mode, and, and uh, we, we've seen a number of questions throughout the session today related to how do you make this happen? How do you reimagining? How do you reimagine capitalism, and what are some of the levers? So specifically, how can or should you know this new thinking that you're describing be implemented? What are the most effective levers? Is it tax policy? Is it regulation? Um, is it you know top managers' incentives? Uh, who are typically driven by short-term performance, you know, because they've got low incomes and, and uh, sorry, high incomes, as well as uh, significant share components to their compensation. We're talking really about changing cultures, and it's very difficult to change cultures by regulation. I hope we do a lot more to bring about the kind of shifts 
by having the kind of exchanges which we've been having this afternoon. Yeah, and I, I think John gave some very good views of that earlier on with the levers he, he was suggesting pulling. I mean, I, I, I do think, um, I, I do, as I totally agree on the, on the cultural side, it's like even in education behaviors, I think, as we're getting at. But I, I also think investors have an important role to play. We have a lot of long-term money out there that doesn't behave in a short, in a long-term way. It behaves more in a short-term way. And I think that, you know, if, if I, I think that's a, that, that is a lever that, that we need to look at. Uh, and it's an area that can have a lot of influence on a leadership team in a corporation to say, you know, this is what we're actually looking for, um, you know, a, a, these broader set of metrics, not, not corporate social responsibility, but more things that relate to, you know, you, they look at things like employee engagement because it actually matters to the performance of the business uh, in, in, where it's, uh, in where it's moving. They look at the innovation rate of the, what, what, what is the R&D spend and where, where are you moving through it? And do you help these organizations stop doing short-term things that destroy long-term value? This is, again, with the activists. Uh, we talked about this before. I think there, you know, activism is like cholesterol. There's good, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. I think some activists are very good because companies are sleepy and they need a, a jolt. Uh, but then when you have the activists that are about really trying to maximize a short-term set of trades at the risk of, you know, wrecking a company, and there are, there are a number of those out there, that's where I think long-term investors have to also step in and back the leadership team, be more active themselves. Anyhow, so I think the investors are a, a lever in this area. So on to our last question, which is, what can all of our alumni on the line today do to help us reimagine capitalism and move toward this more longer-term approach? Hear what we're saying, read what we're writing, and go out and tell other people. Totally. And I think just in everyone's roles, I think our alumni are playing roles in all parts of the capitalist ecosystem, there's, there's things to be done in every part of it. Um, and so I, I think, and, I, and the thing is to do, is to, is to do something, even, even what you might consider a little thing to do, I think is a big thing when we add it up across the, the ecosystem. So I think what we can't do is just step aside and watch it unravel in some, some places. I think we've got to step in and push, write, talk, invest differently, whatever. Dom and John, thank you again for joining us today. Um, for those of you who are attending, if you'd like to share your virtual applause, just go to the participants panel on the upper right side of your screen and click the raise your hand button at the bottom of that panel. And on behalf of the firm, thank you all for participating in today's alumni event. We hope you enjoyed it. We appreciated all your questions. If you have any further thoughts or questions you'd like to share, please use the contact information that you see on this slide or email us at alumni underscore relations at mckinsey.com. We also want to remind you of a number of new webcasts we'll be offering over the coming weeks. On February 8th, The Age of Analytics. On February 23rd, HR of the Future. On March 8th, An Integrated Perspective on the Future of Mobility. And on April 25th, The Case for Digital Reinvention. Details for these and other upcoming alumni events, as well as alumni news, career and talent services, firm news and knowledge, and the alumni and firm member directory are all available on the alumni website. Finally, we'd appreciate it if you take a few moments to complete our brief feedback survey, which will appear when you close out your event console. For those who joined us by mobile today, you may access the survey via the link that we're providing right now in the chat panel. This survey will also be your opportunity to request a complimentary ebook of Reimagining Capitalism. Thank you in advance for sharing your feedback. Dom and John, thank you again for taking the time with us today. We hope you all have a wonderful day or evening and look forward to having you join us again soon at another exclusive McKinsey alumni event. Thanks again. Thank you.